All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Surviving Hollywood Podcast. My name's Austin. My name is Aaron. And I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. And we just had a great guest, Bubba Ginnity, comedian by trade, runs a huge show that you guys probably heard of. Um, it's all virtual. It's called In Crowd, which you can participate. There'll be a link down below in the description. You can hop on Zoom, watch live music, live comedy. It's a virtual event that holds up to 5,000 in general admission attendees, 300 VIP. And this guy runs it. And he talked out all about having Sarah Silverman, you know, different uh, comedians on these shows, which you guys can watch. What do you guys think? Of so, so, so this is a new um, entertainment experience for musicians and comedians. And basically the way it's set up is the comedians go into like a black box space with no live people around them. Then they're basically looking at, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, they're looking at what you're looking at, just like faces of couples or single people watching the comedy show or watching the, the music show. And if it's comedy, they can interact just like it's a normal thing. Seems like a pretty cool idea since everybody wants to get back out there, whether to enjoy a show or to actually perform a show. Uh, it was really cool hearing about this, this thing. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a great way to like bring entertainment to your home. Like everyone's still sort of in this semi lockdown or whatever you want to call it. And uh, now you can actually watch like a live comedian doing something like that's, I think that's pretty cool. And then plus they interact with you, like the, the way he explained it in some of the clips that we saw, like, because it has like the person's name on the zoom wall, you can see like, Hey Dave, like nice background buddy. You know what I mean? So like, I think it's cool that like in this weird way, even though the audience isn't there, you can still connect with them on a different level because they're like in their house and what more personal, how more personal can it be like in your home? Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. And then um, I thought he had some really good stories about uh, growing up in Boston, uh, kind of, you know, going through the Boston comedy circuit. And uh, he had some funny stories about a DUI, which uh, I can relate to. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, good times, man. Um, I had a lot of fun. This, this guy seems like a dude that you want to hang out with, you know, good guy. Gra grab a beer with or something, right? Yeah, uh, so guys, enjoy the episode, especially if you're a stand-up comedian. Really good episode. Where did, uh, where did the name come from? Nickname. Uh, my dad used to call me that when I was young, man, and then said it in front of some friends when I was probably like seven years old, and, and it never went away. And when I was like 16 years old, I tried to change it. I came, I stumbled into a room, all my friends drunk in Boston, and I was like, no more Bubba, like Bubba's dead, like no chick <laughs> wants to bang a dude named Bubba, you know what I mean? And then, they, of course, in true Bostonian fashion, they all just like cried laughing on the floor, and I was yeah. never called anything else ever again, you know? And so, that's, when, that's when you became a comedian. So here we are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had to make the, I had to make the joke last, last What, while, what about when Forrest Gump came out, man? That wasn't like a big thing. Oh, dude. I mean, <laughs> all day just... long, dude, Bubba Gump shrimp, Forrest <laughs> Gump. I mean, Bubba Sparks, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, man. you could go down the list, dude. You know, I've heard them all, but it's cool. Uh, I mean, Bubba's Bubba. I mean, you got don't drop the soap, Bubba. I mean, yeah. there's, there's a million Bubba's, dude. Did, did you hate it as a seven year old kid? I feel like that would probably was kind of annoying. No, nah, I was kind of rocking as a kid, man. Yeah. Just because it was like unique and I stood out. And, you know, it's the funny thing about like living your life by like a nickname, you know, um, you know, people kind of, you just kind of embody this character and this character gets put on you. And I mean, I'm, I'm in my thirties now and I'm still playing that character as you can see, but you know, it's like, it's ironic. You know, people would tell stories about Bubba in front of me and I'd be like, that's, that's me. And that's not how that story goes. You know what I mean? But yeah. Nicknames are interesting. You know, obviously in the South, I'm sure this isn't a nickname. It's probably people's birth name. But, you know, in the Northeast, <laughs> if your name's Bubba, it's probably a nickname. You know? Yeah. Right. So, so us, go ahead. Oh, you go. No, I was going to say, so tell us a little bit about, you kind of just touched on it right now, but kind of uh, growing up in Boston, um, how did you kind of get into comedy? I mean, growing up in Boston, man, I mean, comedy is a way of life. I mean, sarcasm and quick wittiness is how you survive the, the, the recess to the to the to the friday night with your friends so the, you know what i mean it's like goes all the way man and if you're not you know the faster and the funnier you are the the quicker you survive and the less fights you get into you know what i mean because you know no you know 
some people rather get punched in the face to get made fun of. You know what I mean? So, you know, being funny in Boston will get you a lot further than most things. And, and that's kind of how I deflected things. You know, I mean, like all comedians, we're just, we're just deflecting and pushing, you know, energy that hurts us into a, into a space that feels good. You know what I mean? And then I learned how to do that at a young age. And, you know, my, some of my closest friends that have never touched the microphone on stage are the funniest fucking dudes I know, you know? So if you can, mm. if you can survive my house at a barbecue on a Sunday, man, there, there ain't no stage you can't stand on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think my whole life was building towards being able to, you know, endure the highs and lows of a, of a live performance. You remember, uh, you remember the first set? Yeah, man. You know, what's funny, man. My first, I, I got into this a little bit different than everybody else. Like I always talked about doing stand up, and I was like, you know, I, and I was always a funny, crazy dude could always tell stories. I mean, a story about me going to Seven Eleven to get a fucking taquito is entertaining. You know what I mean? So, so when I, when I started, you know, talking about, Oh man, I should do fucking stand up. You know what I mean? Like my girl at the time worked at a comedy club and there was like a showcase for like this like comedy writing workshop, like class thing that was in there. And most fucking purists right now that are listening to this podcast are like, oh, this dude took a fucking comedy class. What a fucking loser. You know what I mean? And, and that's cool. And we, we can hash it out in a fucking roast battle if you want. But, <laughs> but, but the reality is, is like she saw that thing happen and all the comedians were good. And she knew I had been talking about it. And I just needed a little push to like activate. And she like basically as a Christmas present, put me in the fucking comedy class and I didn't want to go because I'm a purist just like the people I just talked to and I was like I'm fucking taking class to learn how to be funny you fucking kidding me you know what I mean <laughs> but you know like the like a good boyfriend does he shows up and does it because that's what she wants and then it ended up being a great experience man it was nothing like what I thought no one was teaching me how to fucking tell jokes no one was making me be corny and funny they were just you know the guy was just you know Jerry Katzen was just teaching me how to like dig deep into my life and 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 be able to talk about it in front of people and 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 find the funny and all the pain man so when we did the showcase for that class dude i was so confident i invited every dude i knew and let me tell you something about boston dudes man all those dudes that came, I put like 80 people in the seats myself. And those 80 people that came, I'd say 72 of them came to watch me fail. They all came like, oh, he's going to fucking bomb, dude. <laughs> like, we're going to be able to make fun of him for the fucking his whole life off this shit, man. And, and yeah. luckily, I didn't bomb, man. I crushed the first time I ever did this thing, man. And I've obviously had bad sets since then. I'm not fucking invincible. But the first time I did stand up, I was like, oh, dude, this is like killed it for me and this is what i want to do and, and i've been doing this my whole fucking life you know what yeah. i mean and and now i'm just gonna i can do it in a in a in a space where i can get to more people and i can i can put my opinion on things and maybe shift someone's perspective about something and then that's really what comedy is all about to me you know yeah i think that's like that's a lot of like boston fans too right because anyway, i get the celtics hat on yeah but i feel like just in sports in general right boston's obviously huge so yeah, uh, man. by the way, but by the way, uh, you guys swept the Sixers, man. Nice. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens next. I mean, yeah, Toronto's next. So we'll see what happens. I mean, they're yeah. talking about forfeiting the whole thing because of the shooting, which which more power to them. Oh yeah, um, that's right. But, that's right. You know, I mean, we'll see what happens. You know, the world's a fucking crazy place, and I think the NBA is like fighting against that stuff more than most people. And right, you know, hopefully we still get to play the games and, and protest. And but if that's the way they want to go, man, I, I mean, I support it, and we'll take yeah, the totally, easy man. W, I guess. <laughs> in, would you uh would you, go ahead I've been in, asking some in comedy i just want i'm interested because you have the boston perspective does anything go in comedy in terms of pc culture if it's funny does anything go dude listen man if if it's one of the only spaces left for freedom of speech dude if we fucking take comedy away i mean what the hell do we have left dude you know what i mean now am i against hacky comedians making lowbrow fucking jokes absolutely fucking Louis. i think those dudes are pieces of shit and they should work a little harder on writing some jokes dude instead of making low-hanging fruit jokes to tear to tater to one side you know what i mean it's like you don't have to be ignorant to be funny man i i, I live by a rule that's basically like if i didn't live it or i don't feel really passionate about it I don't talk about it on stage. You know what I mean? I don't write jokes to make people laugh. I've never written a joke being like, oh, I wonder if people are going to think this is funny. Like, that shit does not matter to me, man. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I have something to say or I have a unique perspective on something or I had an experience that's worth sharing with people and that's how I approach jokes. And uh, I mean, and if something's not, I am not a politically correct comedian by any means. In fact, I told the line of racism and, and you know, racial experience more than most. I have a, I have a, I have a black partner i have a black daughter you know what i mean like but i'm from one of the most racially turmoil places in the fucking world you know what i mean and and i've had friends who are 
racists when they were young and they became cops and I hate their fucking guts. And I got black friends who, you know, have been treated poorly because they're black. I've also been jumped for being white in the black neighborhood. I've also been pulled over by the cops with four of my friends in the car, all black. I get to go home. I mean, there's, I mean, I've experienced this shit, you know what I mean? And, and, and I talk about that stuff on stage and sometimes, you know, one side of those people in that audience, they don't identify with what I'm saying, especially coming from a white person. It's usually white people that disassociate with what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Because their white guilt is like super present. And I'm given a unique perspective on, on race relations. And, and they don't even know that what I'm saying is true. You know what I mean? And, I mean, one of my best bits about getting, you know, pulled over while drinking and driving. And, you know, this is a true story. Last time I drank, I've been sober nine years. Last time I drank, I was driving. I was shit-faced. I got pulled over by the cops. It was actually like a couple blocks from my house. And, um, you know, I was blacked out, man. And so when they were arresting me, I was like, hey, you know, there's two of you guys. And you're already taking me to jail. I live right down the street. You guys mind dropping my car off before you take me to jail? And they were like, sure, you've been compliant. I was like, oh, shit, these dudes are really going to do this shit. So the cop gets in the front of my car, starts driving to my house, and I'm following the back of the cruiser, man. And we get to my house. He's like, what's pocket spot yours? I'm like, second one on the right. He pulls in there, he pocks it, and I'm sitting in the back of cruiser handcuffed, just looking down the driveway, and he's coming down, and the headlights are on him, and he's twirling my keys. And I'm like, man, you don't know white privilege till you have a cop valet your fucking car, brother. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. dude, valet my car. That's the fucking whitest <laughs> shit in the world. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's is like, it, it's is insane. it okay right there? Is it okay right there? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, he was like, he was like, oh, you need me to fucking get anything out of the trunk? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, what a joke. That would never happen to my black friends. You know what I mean? But that's yeah. like a true story, you know? And you still got in trouble, but you're just, you got your car back? I mean, I still went to jail. I ended up uh, in, you know, this is obviously like going off the fucking tail end, but <laughs> I ended up going to court, man. And I don't know if you know anything about DUIs. And I, I got a DUI too, so I, I get it, man. Okay, if you go there without a lawyer... You know, and you get a public defender because you know you're guilty. You already blew the fucking one point, whatever, your 2.0 right. if you're a maniac. You know what I mean? And, and you, you know, you get in there and they're like, you got two options. They're like, you either pay the fine of X amount of thousand dollars or you do 100 hours of community service or whatever. Now, what I heard about the community service is that you're going to show up at 530 in the morning and you may or may not be one of the people that gets to do the community service. If you do, the hours don't count. And I was like, well, that sounds like a fucking waste of time. So I like looked up the laws online. I'm like, what's the third option? And the third option is to take the jail time. But no one takes the jail time because everyone's scared of jail, you know? So I walked in there and I looked and I looked up some information online how you only serve 10% in LA County because the jail's so overcrowded. And I got up there, man, on my trial day and they were like, how do you plead? I was like, guilty. And they were like, what do you want? Community service or the, or the fucking the fee and i was like i'm gonna take the jail time how, long, how like, long was the jail time i went to the twin towers downtown for two days which i don't okay. suggest it's the fucking worst thing no i mean dude you could die yeah. there in there six hours man the shit i saw there in two days like is like a movie yeah. but you know you know it's like i took the jail time went to jail that day and and never had it you know i saved three grand it was basically like if you called me on the phone like hey you want to go to la county prison for 48 hours for three grand Right. Dude, if I had no job, I'd be like, hell fucking yeah, let's do it. Might, it. might be the only option. Yeah. You know? So that's what I ended up doing. Well, it, it's it's better to go with, to jail when your name is Bubba, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. People stay away from you, <laughs> man, you know. <laughs> right. So uh so tell us about this uh this uh in crowd thing, this uh this new thing you got you started pretty much. Um obviously I'm I'm assuming it was born out of this whole COVID era, you know. Well the show is called comedy. The Secret Comedy Show, and then it's right. put on by In Crowd, correct? So no, uh, Super Secret Comedy Show is one of the shows that we program on our stage. That's an existing show uh, that was curated by this comedian, Hunter Hill, who works with us. And, um, you know, so he kind of bought, brought the show that he was doing already in clubs before the pandemic and, and put it on our stage. And then we also do our own show called In Crowd Comedy Live. We also do headlining shows with all types of people. We did Adam Ray last night impersonating dr phil and he had like joel McHale and joey mcintyre on and you know we've had headlining shows with music artists like tyler rich ali brook and you know so we do a bunch of different things and it, it was spawned in the pandemic we you know uh we were on a bus tour for a stage design that we created for an artist named chami and we were in chicago and you know they said all events were canceled over a thousand people Mm. And we were getting sent home. We were only two weeks into a seven week bus tour, man. And we were like, okay, like this, this is what's happening. So we have a warehouse 
office in LA that has a, you know, rehearsal space. And we like, we got to get all the gear and cameras we need to be able to create and innovate however we see fit. Cause we're moving to the streaming and digital age and we got to be ready. So that's what we did, man. We were ahead of the curve and we were doing music stuff first. We were doing like, you know, we did a Lesso's performance for Tomorrowland and, you know, Flash Adamas' Mad Decent 420 party. And then, and then I just, you know, one moment I just kind of had a light bulb go off as a comedian. I was like, dude, what if I put this, took this audience and put it here in this way and would it work? For, and, for the folks at home, paint the picture. How is this different? How is this different from what exactly? Well, from the video I saw, it's that a comedian is on like a black box stage and it's different because uh, you have like Zoom, uh, you know, people on Zoom calls that they can interact with. Yeah, so we basically have a unique uh, stage design that's built out of LED and we, you know, we, we map a webinar conference on, on it and we have three different departments on manipulating the audio to do what we needed to do so the way the audio is working on this call would never work for the show we're doing you know so so we got with the higher ups at zoom and work with the technicians directly and and we're using our our audio and and stage festival expertise and using mm -hmm. it in a unique way with this webinar stuff and we mash them together and we got a lot of different you know tools that we're using simultaneously to execute it so it's able to work in the way we need it to and we're getting you know late no latency mm -hmm. like a one out like interactive intimate experiences you know what i mean from people's couches with their favorite comedians and favorite music performers and and that shit's never happened even before the pandemic, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. as much as this was spawned in this situation, like this is the digital age that we were progressing towards anyways. And I think we just got catapulted to the future of where we were going and, and we're just happy to be at the forefront, you know? How did, uh, I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but how did logistically, I mean, how long did it take you guys to set this whole thing up? Because it feels like a lot to kind of get going. I mean, we were streaming, you know, just unique production streams for about a month when we had this idea and then that idea took about six weeks to get right mm -hmm. and then after six weeks we were confident enough because at the beginning we were like okay is the technical aspect going to work and how are we going to make that work and then that took a couple of weeks to figure out and get right and then and then we were like is this going to work from a performer standpoint because if it doesn't work for the performer it doesn't work you know what i mean like you could put an audience in front of me all you want but if i can't connect with that audience then i can't perform you know and so we, we tried that out with the intimate show of our family and friends and, and it worked and I got that feeling in my chest that I do that makes me want to be a stand-up comedian. And, and once I felt that feeling, man, and, and it felt that give and take that you do the work for, I knew we were onto something and I knew we could apply it to any genre after that, you know? So then we've just kind of been off to the races. That's what I was going to ask you is it have any of the performers felt really weird performing to like almost a screen in a way, you know, what was the adjustment kind of period for that? I think every performer walks into the building nervous and weary because they've been doing stand-up shows or music shows in Zoom meetings like this where it's very disconnected. Yeah. As, as much as we're having an intimate experience, it's because there's a small group of us that we're right up against the computer. But as a performer, you're not as close to the computer if you're actually performing and there's also way more people. So you can't really connect. So they, you know, they're, they're a little we leery and weary when they step in. But then when they step on the stage before the show starts and see the people and we explain to them how it's going to work, they're like, oh, my god it's like an overwhelming feeling when you stand in there you've never been so embodied by your audience like this before even in a live space i mean i've been on i've been on every festival and, and arena and and venue stage in the world and that's no exaggeration i've seen i've done i've been i've been the guy leading the charge in front of 500 people and i've been the guy leading the charge in front of how 100,000 people at glastonbury you know what i mean and and they, that's an ocean of ants man you know what I mean? Like upstate, it's intimidating, but you, you, you don't catch eye contact with anybody. You know, and here you have 50 to 100 people, their names, their face, what's in their house, like looking at you, like present, like, let's go, buddy. I'm right here. You know what I mean? And they're like, holy shit. You know, like there's no way for you to detach. You know what I mean? So it, so it actually makes for a really intimate experience and it makes for new ways for your creative mind to like evolve in the moment and, and for new inspiration and new ways of making people laugh or playing your music. And, and it's, you know, as much as people want to call it virtual by definition, which it is yeah. technically, I think virtual is a very non-human, very disconnected word. And, and this is a lot more intimate and a lot more human than people would think. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a show like this can hold hundreds and hundreds of people since it's over Zoom. Then you take like the top 100 to 300 and they're like the premium people who like get to interact with the comedian and they're encouraged to keep their mics on so the comedian can hear them laughing and stuff. 
Yeah, so on the ticketed shows, we have a tiered ticket system. We sell a VIP ticket to be on the in-crowd, which gets you on that wall for a portion of the show. And and then we sell a GA ticket that we just send, like, anything, like, seven-camera live performance. You know, you get to watch the show, but you're not on the wall. Your audio is quieted. And the people on the wall, we, we unmute them when they're actually on the wall. And, you know, obviously we get rid of the people that aren't doing it the right way and they're yelling and their dogs bark and we shut them off and stuff because mm-hmm. we monitor them. But you get on the wall and you get to be la- laugh and be present. And, you know, if you say something stupid by accident, the comedian will respond to it just like you would in a club. And, you know, when it comes to the musical performances, you know, we have, you know, a hundred people, you know, waving and clapping and, you know, in between sets yelling and, you know, cla- you know, it's great, man. It's, it's just like a, being at a live show. We have the ability to, you know, to turn those people on and off as we see fit in the programming. And, and during the comedy, we leave them all, like, open. So, I mean, if someone was to heckle, they could. We don't encourage that, just like we don't encourage it at a regular comedy show. But right. if it happens, it's no different than happening in a venue where the comedian will address it. And if it gets out of control, before you depend on a security guy that's getting paid $14 an hour, probably looking at his phone to come and handle that situation. And that doesn't get handled well, mostly. Us, we just go, oh, this is a problem. Boom, press a button, no longer a problem. <laughs> so yeah. that's actually better in a lot of ways for us, you know. You play God in a sense. Yeah, we yeah, we kind of call it God. Yeah. You I know, we're on a God it. mic and <laughs> that's why you know, I got into this business. <laughs> yeah, man. yeah, yeah. You know, we wanna make people disappear, dude. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how how do you uh, cultivate talent? Do you is it is, since it's the whole production, do you have a guy that cultivates talent? And I only ask because we are always trying to cultivate talent, bring talent in for our podcast. And it's half of, let's ask our friends that we've worked with. I feel like Bubba just knows like tons of people. That's what I would think. I know a decent amount of people. Um, we also have people within the company that that's their role. You know, they, they reach out to acts, but it's a lot of existing relationships that got the ball rolling. And now the shows just roll the talent in. You know, every show we do, we got 20 more people that want to do it. We've spoke to every major agency in town and the whole comedy and music departments. You know, we're speaking to huge brands. You know what I mean? I mean, we like the reach, the things that we're about to do programming wise are, are substantial. We have television shows that we're the audience platform and the physical production for that are on, you know, BET and Amazon and Netflix, you know, I, I mean, in the next six months, you're going to see a lot of in-crowd stuff everywhere and it's going to be a thing that, you know, you know, really? right now we're just in the evolution stage. Yeah. And is it more uh, music or more comedy? And what do you think the audience is responding to most? I mean, we just do, we do comedy programming weekly and then we have music programming like pretty much all the time too. Just just more headliner stuff. Um, just cause comedy is more of a consistent thing that, needs work and people like to work out jokes and comedians just want stage time and mm-hmm. audiences are kind of you know engaged in that in that you know evolution of jokes and stuff like that music it's like you come in and you do your hits man so those are more headlining situations but we also are in talks with motivational speakers to preachers to educational mm-hmm. platforms you know so i mean there's a bunch of different things we're going to do that's going to have the crowd name attached to it but it's going to be all different types of genres man and all different types of things and they all and if they're ticketed they all live in a vacuum you know unless you're a fan or a goer of that event that you wouldn't even know we're doing it you know and then you know we obviously tell people and recap everything we do but there's also things that happen that are private and intimate and we, you know we get inquiries for big corporations to do their you know their um, holiday events and program those things i mean there's just a million ways to use this thing man you know from t- ted talk type of things and it's really, it's really exciting, man. And we get to, you know, we, we have such an expertise in stage design and content creation that, that we can re, redevelop anything in the world and any, put you in any scenic element you want and, and kind of manipulate that in real time to, to, to work for you creatively. And that's kind of the part that's so exciting about is us, you know, seeing the artists come in with their own vision and then we take our expertise and apply it to their vision collectively. And, and we have like a whole new show every time. Nice. Who are, yeah. Um, like maybe three comedians that are up and comers that you're that's on your radar now that you could like give a shout out to our audience. 
I mean, dude, you got to, I mean, I wouldn't call her up and come her because she got a Netflix special, but not, not everybody knows her. Sam J has a Netflix special that just came out it's called three in the morning. And it's literally one of the best specials I've watched in the last five years. She's a Bostonian. It's not a biased. I actually am more judgmental of the people I know personally. And I went into it with expectations of it not being as great as it was. And it's, and it's spectacular, you know, and that's definitely one I would, I would push people towards. Um, I mean, there's a lot of great comedians out there, man. Like, I mean, I saw this uh, comedian did our one of our shows the other day named Rachel. Uh, uh, what's her last name? I'm sorry. Let me find her. Uh, oh, Rachel Mack. Rachel Mack, she's blowing up, man. And she's not even my style of comedy, man. She's a lot different than what I would normally be engaged in. And I, and I was re- I was blown away by her performance in, in such a unique space. So, I mean, those are just – and those are two females, man. Look at that. I'm repping yeah, the females. Progressive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, look at me. I'm super PC up here, dude. Only talking about women. I mean, I mean Sam, Sam Jay is an African-American lesbian. You know, we're checking all three boxes here. You know what I mean? But, nice. but she's special whether she was blue, purple, green, and yellow, dude. You know what I mean? And, and that's uh, – uh, and you guys should all know who she is. And Rachel Mack is is also incredible as well. Cool. I was about to ask you about the future of in crowd, but you kind of already touched on it. So, uh, are you going to still want to perform in front of crowds after this is all after things maybe? Yeah, get- yeah, man. I mean, this is the, the world is going to be both. You know, we're going right. to exist, and so does everybody else. And we're going to still tour and do stage designs for festivals, and and we're going to and I'm going to still do stand up and comedy clubs on the east coast and but we're also gonna you know have in crowd things happening and, and i see in crowd as being you know i think stand-up especially is meant to be consumed with the audience even when you not right. watch a netflix special no matter how incredible they are it's not the same as when with an audience so ideally we want to create a platform or do a partnership with an existing platform that embeds in crowd into the performances and we do some of these specials live and you get to like you know pay an extra fee to be on the wall and, and get that experience that you've never had before so that's the vision of where we're going and and you know we're doing everything we can in our power to get there and i think we will well i think it's good i was gonna say if a we have a lot of up-and-coming filmmakers and actors and comedians that watch our podcast if a comedian had a dream to be on your show what would you say are some best practices to get on your radar i mean you can you can dm at in crowd comedy i mean most people on instagram most people in the business would be like, why would you do that? Why would you want people hanging up? Don't even fucking answer them. You know what I mean? It's like, dude, I, I'm that dude. I never DM people like that, but like, I'm, I know I'm an up and comer. You know what I mean? So who the fuck am I to not like look at your tape and, and see if you're good. And, and I don't care how many followers you have, man. Like as much as we're putting like big talent on the stage, cause we have to, and that's how business works. Like my goal here is to, is to blow it up with the big talent and give the up and comers stage time to, to, to have that platform to, to grow. You know what I mean? And, and I'll never stop being that person. And I'm always rooting for the underdog. I'm an underdog myself. And, and if people are funny and then I see their tape and I'm like, dude, they're funny. And I'm already doing that, man. I'm reaching out to people that I think are funny that have no following. And I'm like, let's get them on the stage because they crush you know nope yeah well i think it's a great idea man congrats on uh on uh on in crowd i think it's gonna be i think you kind of talked about how i could you could do all different types of events which i think is a fantastic idea um will I you be talk, a watcher johnny will you be a viewer i will be a viewer yes yeah, so i'll definitely check out the next actually when is the next show we have, a, up? We have a show tonight man i'll send you guys um Oh, perfect, I'll, man. I'll send the PR people a link for you guys to watch, man, and you can you can get it directly. I'd love and, it. And uh, you guys to watch. watch. Tonight. I'm, I'm hosting. We got Maj Jabrani on the show, uh, Joel Kim Booster, Matt Bronger, uh, a bunch of good people, man. Nice, yeah. man. Love to definitely check it out. Uh, real quick, I just want to touch on it just for the, for the audience at home, too. You also have a podcast, too, right? I have a podcast that I just started doing called Talk and Shit with Bubba. And cool. I was just like ready to talk shit, man. You know, I felt like I felt like I just have a lot of time, you know, home to, to rant and I have a lot of you know, Boston a lot of creative do. and I have a lot of creative juices flowing, man, and you know, and I and I just decided that it was time. I mean, I never no offense to you guys, I never thought I would do a podcast. I never I never really wanted to do one. No I listened I listened <laughs> to a lot of them. You know what I mean? I actually like listening to some, but I was like, ah, eh, that's not really for me. And then again, man, I got the push from like the family. Like, dude, you should do one, man. You got a lot to say. And, you know, you got a voice that people might want to listen to. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. We have fun. You know, so I kind of take the very lax approach with no, 
no uh, ex- expectations and, and I, you know, the format is very loose and I, you know, sometimes I have a guest, sometimes that, that week I'm just pissed and I want to talk about what I'm pissed about. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and you, you know, most of my comedy comes from something that angered me or that I don't agree with, or I saw someone or something be wronged by something. And that, and that's kind of what, how I, I'm motivated. You know what I mean? And, and I do a lot of that on the podcast, but I also speak about a lot of like inspirational, you know, I've, I've lived a long life, man. I've done a lot of weird, crazy things and I've worked in a, you know, I've done, I've dug a hole for a concrete cutting company and now I do in crowd, man. I've had experiences across the board and I feel like I can identify with a lot of different people, man. So that's just kind of why I'm doing it. That sounds Is good, it- man. Is it sort of like a, I'm trying to think, is it influences maybe like a Theo Vaughn podcast where it's just maybe himself and sometimes the guest? Really more like Bill Burr. Yeah, yeah Bill Burr. A very Bill Burry. I, I, everyone wants to say Bill Burr when I when I got the Boston hat on and I talk like a fucking maniac, you know what I mean? But, you know, we're very Bill Burry. I mean, Bill Burr is one of the goats, obviously. And, I, and I, as a Boston dude, I'm a I'm biased, you know what I mean? And, um, he's, he's one of the goats. But I'm not comparing comparing myself to Bill Burr, but there's definitely some Bill Burr s type rants in the situation for sure. Hey, uh, pre COVID, I want to change gears a little bit. Pre COVID in Los Angeles, what were some of your favorite or what? Who has the better crowds? The Comedy Store, the Laugh Factory, Flappers for you personally? What I mean, the like? Comedy Store has the has the best crowds, man. You know, I mean, the best rooms. It's the most legendary place to perform. You know, I've been fortunate enough to form on every one of those stages not in the capacity that a that a, a paid regular would but every opportunity i've been able to access i've taken advantage of and i have always you know prevailed and got respect for my peers there and 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 you know but there's some great alt shows man there's some great rooms that people don't even know about you know what i mean and, and um i mean I, I i'm not an alt comedian at all like i go to those shows and people are like whoa this guy just fucking turned the knob to a whole different direction you know what i mean and and i like doing that you know i like walking in places and fucking shaking it up dude and i think i think in crowd shaking up the entire business to a certain degree and you know some people love it and you know some people behind the scenes don't you know just because it's given a lot more power to the people power the performer and and i like rooms that give that power to the artist you know and then if any space that's open for creativity and you know and has an audience that's like accepting i'm, I'm all in it oh cool. love, love it is uh so where can our audience find your podcast and where can they find uh the link for the comedy shows uh the comedy shows you can follow at in crowd comedy on instagram we also have a white website www.incrowd.studio you can find everything there as well um, and for the podcast, you can follow me at, on Instagram at Bubba Ginnity or at Talking Shit with Bubba, T S W B U B B A on Instagram. You know, uh, Johnny just did a uh, TV show with Bobby Lee, and Bobby Lee told oh, Johnny, he was like, when I, ever since I started my podcast, my whole life changed. I went from, I don't know, what did he say, Johnny? He just said it's got exponentially better for his comedy starting the podcast. Yeah, I mean, you know, Bobby Lee's a known comedian stuff. Well, I know Bobby Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I remember he when I worked with him on set, he told me that uh, once he did the podcast, like his career was like, almost like it said it, he said it made me a millionaire that's what he told his co-worker on set <laughs> <laughs> well i, I don't so, know so keep, so keep doing the podcast man. i mean I good know. for him man and i hope that yeah. shit happens to me but for me us, man, us too. for me i think it's a really good platform to develop jokes and you don't even know the jokes that happen man i i run back my podcast i hate listening to myself but i do it literally only for this purpose i listen to the podcast back before i release it just to get jokes man you know like because when you're in a free space i think the biggest problem for all performers especially comedians is is that wall that's in between who they actually are and who they think they should be on stage you know and the and the great people they crack that wall man you know what i mean dave Chappelle ain't anything but dave Chappelle on stage bill burr ain't anything but bill burr on stage now did they work on the jokes and shit of course they did but they're not they're letting themselves live presently on that stage or they wouldn't be so great. You know what I mean? And, right. and I think the, I think a podcast is a real safe space to just be who you are and, and say whatever you want. You know what I mean? And, and let that stuff come freely. And then you can take that and tailor it for the stage and, and have all types of new material. So I'm sure Bobby's like eating off both sides of that coin and, and that's what it's all about, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to check out the podcast, man. And, uh, We'll check out the show tonight as well. So, if, yeah, if Anderson can send over that link, we'd love to, to watch it too, man. So, 
Yeah, 100%. Uh, I'll send it. To, I'll, we only generate the link about 90 minutes before the show. Cool. So I'll just have them, like, get in touch with you guys, and then I'll send it to them. And, or maybe they can connect us directly or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally, man. Well, yeah. I appreciate, appreciate your time, Bobby. Uh, Bobby Bubba. Sorry, man. It's all good. <laughs> Bobby, Bubba. Bubba, Bubba, Bubba. Flip it all over. It's up, man. You want, bro. I had I've too much to drink everything. this morning, man. Sorry. Dude, I've been uh, called everything in the fucking world, dude. It's all good. <laughs> uh, but thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll make sure the audience checks that out, man. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate you, Bubba. Take care.